what if Einstein had been a woman? <laughs> Let's say Anna Einstein, not Albert. Who would she be? What would her thoughts be like? And would we know her name today? So I want to take you back to 1905. That's widely called Einstein's miracle year. That she would have been writing four amazing papers. And in those four amazing papers, she would be putting forward some incredible ideas, ideas worth spreading. She would have known all about Ted long before us. Um, she'd be claiming that space and time, they are not what we think they are. The space between space itself is not what we think it is. Energy and matter, they are linked. Energy is matter, and matter is energy. And in the universe, there is a single cosmic speed limit, the speed of light. These are startling ideas even today. So imagine what it would have sounded like back then in 1905. Would the world have listened? Well, what was the world like in 1905 for women? Well, in 1905, most women in the world could not even vote. In academia, most women could not enroll at the top universities. Harvard actually had a sister university called Radcliffe, but most other universities did not even have that option. But what women were perceived to be good at and did have a role in society for was to be a homemaker, a mother and a wife. And even Roosevelt, who actually um, was for the right of women to vote, even he believed that certainly there was a specific role for women to play in society. So it's not looking good for Anna, is it? But it's not all bad news. I want to tell you about another year, which I actually can call the other miracle year. It's 1903, and something amazing happens. Marie Curie becomes the first woman ever to win a Nobel Prize, and it's in physics. Anna's subject. So Anna would have been perhaps inspired by this. But even with the Nobel Prize, Marie Curie herself faced challenges her whole life as a woman in physics. In 1911, she did not get elected to the French Academy of Sciences with the Nobel Prize. As a scientist in the Academy put it, women cannot be part of that institute. Marie Curie never reapplied for membership in the French Academy. I wonder why. But she did let her work speak for her. The very same year, she wins another Nobel Prize. <laughs> That's how you answer your critics. <laughs> Let's move forward to 1927, another historic moment in physics. That's at the Solvay Conference, a, a true gathering of great minds. 17 of the attendees were either past or future Nobel Prize winners. And among them, only one had won two Nobel Prizes. And that was still Marie Curie, the lone warrior. But I'd like to think that Anna Einstein would have been there still in the picture, following in Marie Curie's footsteps. So it's been a long time, over a century since Curie's first Nobel Prize. And you might think, well, there must have been other women inspired by her. And so there, you know, where are, what's happened? Have we, ha have we had more women in physics? And ha have that, has that led to more uh, Nobel Prize winners? You know, the top award in physics. And the answer is yes. The number has doubled. We're doing well. <laughs> so in another 100 years, we may have four. In fact, there have been studies, a very recent study, which shows that it would take perhaps another 100 years or more before half the faculty in, in science in, the, in universities here in the US and Canada is similar, would be held by women, another 100 years. So what's happened, though, in the last 100 years? W women have made huge strides. So women can vote. Women can go to the top universities. But perceptions are much harder to change. And women are still viewed today more as a homemaker than a physicist. And this starts early. Perceptions start uh, building early. And there have been many tests of, um, of this kind of a perception. One of the famous ones is called the draw a scientist test. And it's been repeated over and over again to um, students from fifth to all the way to eighth or 10th grade 
to see what is it, well, how do they think of a scientist? And typically this is what is the standard image, yeah. So, and you know, that is one of the reasons that the number of women who are signing up to study physics is still low over a century later. I myself actually fell in love with math and science at a very early age. So I did decide I want to study physics. You know, little did I know what was in store for me. But so as I took more and more physics classroom, or classes, my classrooms started looking like that. So often, it was a lonely place. Often I was the only woman there or maybe one of two at the But in those classrooms, I found a new power, the power of invisibility. <laughs> some of my students didn't seem to know I was there. Even some of the professors. Good morning, gentlemen, they would say when they came into class. And then I found that I was not the only woman in physics who has this power. Other women in physics and some of the other sciences had it too. And it didn't go away as I took more and more and more uh, courses in physics. So over time, you know, it's a good thing. Sometimes it's good to disappear, honestly. But <laughs> you can't turn it off when you want to. So over time, if you stay invisible, you start wondering, maybe I'm not being seen because I'm not supposed to be here. Maybe Roosevelt was right, and maybe this isn't my role. So the doubts come, Am I, do I belong here? So the question came up over and over again. And then finally, you know, I'm standing here, I'm a physicist, so I did find an answer. And my answer came to me from physics. When I started looking at all the equations that describe the laws of nature, I did not find a single parameter or number or value or variable gender. In fact, what I did find was knowledge and understanding and beauty and elegance and inspiration. And that was also not limited by my gender. The universe did not care whether I was male or female, visible or invisible. The laws of physics, they apply the same. Gravity, F here, this equation is for force. It's not for female. And M is for mass, not male. Gravity will apply the same no matter who you are. Try it out for yourself. <laughs> I did not find a gender variable because there isn't one. So I stayed and I continued on. Finally, I decided that I want to focus my research in the area of quantum physics. Now, quantum physics, the laws of quantum physics apply to um, particles such as atoms and electrons and photons. And these are microscopic particles. If you take a human hair, the thickness of a human hair, and zoom in by a factor of a million, then you would read photons. And clearly, if you zoom, zoom in that much, that's a scale that we cannot see. So maybe that's why I was drawn to quantum mechanics. Because like me, the atoms had a power of invisibility as well. So of course, I wanted to see these fellow invisible atoms. But how do you see something that is invisible? Well, it's sort of like trying to see an invisible man. You can't see the man, but you can see his foot footprints in the sand. So I'd have to look for the footprints of the way that one could try to, to do that is to shine a laser light at a cloud of atoms. So when, when a, a laser beam hits a cloud of atoms, the atoms interact with the laser beam and they leave that footprint of the interaction of the light and that property is the polarization so you can if we collect the light and look at that property of polarization and look uh, using you know over a long time then using our tools we can actually reconstruct what those atoms really look like and get a picture and this is schematic from my collaborator Paul Yesen's uh, lab in um, the University of Arizona where they can actually do these kinds of amazing experiments. So it took a while, but after several years, we had a picture. Now quantum mechanics, of course, has some laws. One of the things, you cannot actually pinpoint exactly where a quantum particle is. It's called the uncertainty principle. You can kind of only get to the point where you know some likelihood of where it is. So the picture I'm going to show you is really a picture of likelihood. 
that blob there, it's a probability distribution. The red area shows where that atom is most likely to be, and the blue is where it's not least likely to be. So what's not is that this atom is actually surrounded by a barrier, the kind of barrier that you and I, in our everyday macroscopic world, cannot cross. But of course, quantum mechanics is different. So what we can do is we can make pictures like this over time and watch what this atom actually does, and make a movie. So here it is. Watch that atom. That, that atom is not sitting still. It is acting like there is no barrier at all. It's doing something that we call tunneling. It's walking through a wall. And to me, this was amazing to see it, because of course I knew about tunneling, but this was the first ever movie of its kind ever made. So that was amazing, but there was another thing that I found personally, a message in here. Nature is telling us that no barrier is too high to cross. Here's another picture of this atom, another movie. Move over Hollywood. We have lots of cool <laughs> movies here. So, and you see that the atom is doing something completely different. It's doing this random chaotic dance. And you may have heard of chaos theory. The most famous example of chaos theory is you know, where a butterfly flaps its wings somewhere here, and eventually there's a storm in Australia. Small changes can make big effects, and that's chaos. And we have seen it in effect in our, our world, such as in weather patterns, in population dynamics, even in the stock market but not ever in the quantum world till now. So that was another incredible moment to be able to catch these atoms doing this beautiful chaotic dance. So, so far my journey as a physicist has been really interesting and the universe is an incredible place and I've learned a lot about the laws of, of nature and I've found you know, for these incredible particles and been able to watch them dance. But the universe has taught me a lot more than that taught me that there is no gender variable, variable out there. The laws of the universe are gender blind. And you cannot be invisible forever. Even the invisible becomes visible. No barrier is too high to cross. The impossible can be made possible. And even the smallest changes can have huge consequences. And we can boldly go where no woman or man has ever gone before. And we are doing that. We are doing that right here in Waterloo. We're building a center which will promote not only research and achievements of, by women in science, but also will explore the challenges faced by those women in science today. So that we can build a strong community, a strong community of women in science, as well as those who study science, so that we are ready to face the next 100 years. Because we should not, and we will not wait for another hundred years. And also because somewhere out there, maybe even today, the next Marie Curie and Anna Einstein, they're waiting to be found. Thank you.